Good morning. Good to be in God's house. Wow, it's a great day out there. Amen. Starting to turn warm here in Delaware, wherever you are watching. So welcome, Middletown and all of our body of Christ that are there and all who are still at home. And we love you and um, we're so glad you're, you're with us today. Hey, I just want to tell you before I get in the word that um, Pastor Barb and I will be leaving on Monday night. We'll be flying to India, so we're going to go visit our pastors in India and our ministry called Love of Christ Church India. For those that are new, we've got 84 pastors there that are uh, doing like 400 village churches uh, overseeing those and about 12,000 people in them. They see over 1,000 people every year get saved, and last year we baptized, I think it was 900 and something people, and they're just doing amazing, amazing work. Let's just give them a warm hand of appreciation. Thank you, love of Christ Church India, our pastors. I'm looking forward to being with you if you're watching today, and we're going to bring them in to two different locations this time, in the north, because India is such a, it's like going to California, it's so far apart. They have to travel by days on buses, literally 24 hours a day sitting in a bus. And so this time, uh, Barbara and I are going to go to the north and meet with a group and then go in the south and meet with a group and do some training. Uh, an exciting thing, the Lord led on my heart to uh, teach them the book of Revelation. I'm going to give them all that teaching in one, one, like two sessions. Amen? Won't that be exciting? But there are more, they'll sit longer than you guys will, so... Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll share that with you. I've already sent it over there, and I'm going to have it translated in Hindi and Telugu so that uh, we're speaking in two different languages there, and uh, they're going to get this teaching. So that way there I can fly. They're going to have notes, and uh, all the blanks are going to be filled in, so uh, I'll be able to move fast. So you'll be praying that I do that. Amen. It's going to be an exciting time. Uh, but we're really excited, and uh, pray for us that we have safe travels and safety and the persecution issues and uh, the, the government and the COVID. There's no COVID in India, I believe. Amen? So uh, it's gone away in Jesus' name. And so we're just going to have a great time and encourage our pastors. They're doing such a great work. They love you, and uh, we love them. And so they're praying for you all the time and for us, and we're praying for them because we're one big family. So uh, we'll have a couple of speakers that are guys that you've just loved. They've got, they got a message on their heart, and they're going to just knock it out of the park again. So uh, stay tuned and be a part. We'll be out two weeks, and then we'll be back in the Revelation again and on fire telling you about India. So today we're talking about the seven seals. Last week we had an amazing message. It was a fun message for me. Did you all enjoy that message? Yeah, that was an amazing message. I had fun. Holy Spirit had fun. He came in, and, and I think it, God was just trying to say, that was the good part. Uh, the church is there. The, I've been talking to the church. The church is raptured. We're looking into heaven, and we're seeing what's going on in heaven. And it, really, that whole concept of heaven on earth is in heaven. He actually, I thought, was as I was just meditating it between services, like he's taking us into heaven at that stage and that's what's going to happen. The rapture is going to happen. His bride, the church, you that are believers, we're going to be taken into the Father's house that's been prepared for us. And then, then all these things are going to start unfolding upon the earth. So you can be happy. Remember, you might think the next few lessons, because we're going to go through three seals, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And it's kind of like uh, not the most wonderful time, but the good news is because it says, blessed are you if you read this and study it and take it to heart. And that word blessed means happy. You're going to be happy with these messages. You're going to be happy today. And the reason you're going to be happy is because you're not going to be here. Amen. And that's what you need to keep saying to yourself and not get caught up in this. Don't be worried. Don't be like, oh, no. The thing that you do is be ready. If you're not ready, you need to make yourself ready and then tell others. That's what we should be doing is telling others. All right, let's get into our seals. We got so much to deal with in this short amount of time. The first seal, uh, we see God reveals a white horse, and that is the Antichrist being revealed. We see in Revelation 6.1, he says, I watched 
as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And you remember, they had the scroll that had the wax seals on it that no one could open but Jesus. Now Jesus is opening those seals and each one reveals an, another phase. And here it says, the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse its rider had a bow, and the bow was an instrument like, you know, a bow and arrow, an instrument of war. That was the, the, the vision that he was given. He was given a crown representing authority. So he was given authority, and then it says, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And what we see here is the unveiling of the Antichrist. Yes, he's going to be powerful. He's going to be riding on a white horse. They're going to see him as the Savior. I really believe when he shows up, the world is going to bow at his feet. The world is going to just think he's the greatest person in the world. Uh, the Jewish people, I think, are going to begin to believe that he's their Messiah, that he is the Christ, the one they've been looking for. And that's why he comes riding on this white horse, symbolic of victory and, and power and authority. But that's just the beginning. And then it's going to turn into this awful he beast that he becomes as we see it. You know, Daniel, 500 BC, 500 years before Christ. So that's 2,500 years ago. God revealed a vision to Daniel and we see that in Daniel 9 and 26, and he's talking about this person. He says, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. And he, this, this person, this beast, this antichrist, who he's speaking of, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. So for seven years, he will set up and make these promises. I'm going to bring peace. I'm going to bring order. I'm going to make everything good. And everybody's going to go, yeah, go. Yeah, we're behind you. We're going to worship you. And then in the middle of the seven, the first three and a half years are going to seemingly possibly be somewhat okay. But in the middle of that, in the, which is the middle of the seven, that's three and a half years, he will then put an end of the sacrifice and offering which really it, scholars believe, and it shows over and over again that throughout the scriptures that in the end, the temple will be rebuilt. And you can Google it or, or YouTube it, you know, the temple being rebuilt. There are plans underway, priests are being prepared, all the bowls, all the instruments, all the, the sacrificial altars, everything is prepared. They're looking, they're waiting, they're just knowing they're gonna get to rebuild their temple on the temple mount. And somehow this guy is going to be instrumental, I think, in helping that begin. And they're going to offer sacrifices again, just like they did under the, the old covenant. And so they're going to think this is their Messiah bringing world peace and restoring Israel to their greatness. And, but then it says, on the wing of the temple, he will then set up an abomination that causes a desolation until the end that it's decreed is poured out on him. So he's not going to be successful. He will be destroyed, and that'll be fun to watch. So y'all stay tuned on that. But when you understand this, is that something's going to be set up. He's going to open the temple. He's going to allow sacrifice. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of these three and a half years, he's going to set up something that's going to be so vile to the Jewish people. And it's probably going to be, scholars believe, a statue of himself. Because ultimately, he calls the whole world to worship him. You know, you will either bow, you will worship me, the beast, or you will die. You will not be able to buy or sell or do anything. You'll take my mark and worship me, or you won't. So this is kind of the, the, the signal that Daniel gave, and we'll see that kind of as we wrap up this whole message today. The first seal, white horse, the Antichrist, is showing up. We believe the Antichrist, many do, he's, not gonna be, he's gonna begin as a person that's normal, that's a human being. And that many scholars believe, which makes a lot of sense, that the, that the devil has been preparing a person in every generation. Because if you think about it, no one knows the hour of the day, remember? Except God, and so the devil didn't know, but he knows there's gonna come a time when he can have a person in power that's gonna bring destruction. So maybe that guy was one of the Caesars. Maybe that guy was one of the conquerors. Maybe that guy was, you know, but he did, it didn't happen. Hitler is 
many other things. He's, you know, cutting on power. Uh, but, you know, there's things like that. So it's just somebody is out there could be right now. Could be somebody we don't know, or it could be somebody that maybe has been in the news the last week. We don't know. A conqueror. Second seal. That's how close we are, people. Amen. A red horse comes on, and that represents world war. Revelation 6, 3, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out on a fiery red one. The rider was given power to take peace. In other words, the opposite of peace is war from the earth and make men slay each other. And to him was given a large sword. In other words, he is going to put in the hearts of mankind, which always is there. He's always stirring them. Jesus said there's always going to be wars because men are evil. They want power. They want control. Uh, I don't understand it, but that's because there's evil in their hearts. You can't appease the devil. He is going to kill, steal, and destroy. And so he is now going to come onto the scene, and now all of a sudden world war is going to break out. Now, in these seals... One of the things I wanted you to notice, because it kind of came to me, is that these first seven things that are happening are in the realm of what's natural. In other words, a man showing up and being charismatic and everybody loves him, uh, you know, in the world. That could happen. You can understand that. Uh, a world war. There could be a world war. Somebody was on the news, just a Russian guy, and he says the next world war will be a nuclear war. Like he was warning America, if you get involved in Ukraine, the, the bombs may start dropping, you know, and the missiles. And I don't know if you heard this or not, but I, it's, it's amazing. It says that, that Russia has 10,000 nuclear warheads. I mean, how many do you need to destroy the earth, you know? I mean, like, that's a little overkill, don't you think? You know, but that's how powerful, that's how amazing, that's how setting a lot of this fire and destruction could be nuclear war, world war. The third seal was the black horse, and that represents famine. He said in verse 5 of 6, he said, When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and look. And there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Now what that represents is, and when he's scaled, it means you put money and wheat in both sides, and that's how you're paying it. And what it's going to be is a supply chain issue. It's going to be other issues because war has broken out all over the world. And now you can imagine we have a little bit of COVID happen and the world almost crumbles. Think what would happen if there were nuclear bombs dropping all over the world. There would be a lot of confusion and, and, and lack of food or l distribution. Everybody say the word distribution. Because that's really what famine is, mostly when you see it. And so what he's saying is it takes a whole day's wage to buy one loaf of bread. You work all day. That's how whatever you make in a day, you could buy one loaf of bread for your whole family. And then he says, or you could get three you know, measures of barley because barley was always a lot cheaper for some reason. You know, it just wasn't tasty. It didn't make as good a bread. It was edible, but it was always much cheaper. And so he was trying to say it was cheaper. But someone shared with me uh, between the services and it really spoke. It says, but do not damage the oil and wine. And what that speaks of is that the rich people, which is oil and wine, those that are ultra rich in the world, they're not going to be starving. It's going to be all the other people. Somehow they're going to be able to have enough money. When you got a hundred billion and a billion is a thousand million, guess what? You can buy a lot of bread for that. Amen. So that kind of is symbolic that there's going to be a distribution problem between the rich, ultra rich, just like we see today, having everything no matter what, and the, the ones that are trying to live with their families, they're going to be in desperate needs. But again, world war, famine, which then leads us to the fourth seal, which is the pale green horse, which is death. In verse 7, it begins and it says, When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. A pale horse. 
Now that word pale in the NIV is translated pale. It's a Greek word that is like colorous. Colorous is the Greek word. Now some have contrasted that as ashen or all kinds of different colors, uh, yellow and whatever. But when you look at it, most scholars believe colorous. That's the word that we get chlora fill from. You know the word chlorophyll? And if you're not a, a, a botanist, a chlorophyll is what makes grass green. That's the green color in grass, chlorophyll. So this is a pale green, like deathly sign or of, of a horse. And its rider was named Death and Hades. Hades, some people think that means hell and the fire and the pit. It really just means the grave. It's where there's going to be much death and much people being buried all over the world. And following close behind, they were given power over a fourth of the earth. So just think, seven, eight billion people, one fourth, one fourth, 25% of the earth uh, are going to be killed. This is like a devastating thing, but it's still in the realm of natural. And I say natural because... At this point, God's not releasing supernatural things, which we're going to get to see some exciting, amazing things. I mean, there's going to be amazing creatures flying around, stinging people and all kinds of good stuff. It's going to be like a, a, a war movie or something, you know, something from outer space. But still, again, it's a natural thing that, that death and a fourth of the people, but it's kind of a progression. It says killed by the sword, that's the war, the famine, and then the plague. And the plague, are, these are all natural events. If war breaks out and then there's famine, people's resistance gets down, the water you know, issues go down, the pollution increases, you know, getting food, getting water, safe things, all of a sudden plagues start happening, disease. But then it says, and, they, and by the wild beast of the earth. Now I was always, even as a, a young believer, Many, many, many years ago, I said, wild beasts, does that mean like the lions and the bears and the tigers and the squirrels are going to come out, you know, and start attacking us? You know, I didn't know what. But in the research of this, I found out that that word wild beast, it's not really meant to, I don't think, to imply wild animals because this word is just one word. It's called therion. And 46 times it's shown in the scriptures, 46 times. And, and really, it shows up 38 times alone in the book of Revelation. And all times except three times where it's translated wild beast, all the other times it's just translated beast. And remember, this is what we talked about. The Antichrist comes on the scene, and what is he called? And when he says, you'll take my mark, it's the mark of the beast. And when he comes as this false prophet, it says, then another beast appears and he's going to be his false prophet it's and it represents to me uh the antichrist his false prophet and really the release of all man men that are politically power and control and it's the people who are evil bent on destroying the world so this is not like the wild animals but the wild politicians and governments and military generals that are going to come and and release this death of one-fourth of all humans as we look at it now we come to the fifth seal fifth seal represents these martyrs in revelation 6 9 it says and they open the fifth seal and I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain. Now, this is kind of symbolic because it's under the altar in the temple because the altar under the altar was where they poured the blood of the bulls and goats so that, you know, it satisfied the sacrifice of the sin. So now their blood is being poured at the altar, and there's where they stand. And it says they've been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Now, I, what I believe is that what we're seeing all the death of the people that are martyrs that are going to heaven are people who are left behind. And you can just imagine the world. They may be some of your friends, your family, your co-workers, your fellow students in school, your neighbors, everyone, millions of people in countries like India that never heard the name of Jesus. They've been left behind, but can you imagine when the church is raptured and there's just going to be a gasp? They're going to say, oh, no, 
uh, my neighbor was right. <laughs> I really messed up. I'm left behind. And now they get into the word probably. They realize that Jesus is real. They realize their fate is coming. And now they believe. But when they believe in that phase, we're protected as the bride. They're going to have to die. They will, everyone uh, except the last remaining few, they'll be killed because of their faith if they don't deny him and take the mark. And that's what we see here. And it says, they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. You know, we, and especially if we just went through death and torture and our saw our families, our kids and everything, we, we want, you know, avenge, you know, but God is always long-suffering. I want you to see throughout Revelation, he is long-suffering. He is merciful. He is loving. And even here, he's wanting to give time for more people to come to faith. And it says, and they were each given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed, and they had been completed. So, there is a number God is waiting for before he releases his judgment at another level. It's just starting here. Fifth seal, martyrs. Now, the sixth seal is, is open, but I, I saw three kind of separate phases in there. The first one is the world trembles. Revelation six twelve. I watched, and as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun turned black like the sackcloth made from goat hair. And, and goat hair and sackcloth, the, the goats they used were black hair. You know, we kind of think of goats as being brown or white. But the special breed of goat in, in the Israel was black. And so there's a blackness that comes over the sun. The whole moon has turned blood. And all of this is symbolic. And we'll see again when we get to the trumpets. I believe massive air pollution because it's changing the atmosphere. What you cannot see because the pollution or the a volcanic eruption because these earthquakes, I believe, are also going to be volcanic in nature and all those things. It's changing the atmosphere around it. And it says in verse 13, And the stars in the sky fell to the earth like late figs from the fig trees that were shaken by a strong wind. The angels receded like a star scroll rolled up, and every mountain and every island was removed from its place. Guess what? That sounds like pretty terrible shaking. Have any of y'all ever been in an earthquake? Have y'all ever been in an earthquake, a few of you? Some of you had, you just didn't know. It. They have earthquakes in Delaware. Did y'all know that? I mean, several years I was sitting in this building. I remember sitting in this office, and it's all concrete floor, and all of a sudden I thought I was imagining. I felt the whole thing, not violently, nothing fell off the wall, but that is a weird feeling when solid concrete shakes. Can you imagine the fear that's going to come in the world when what they thought was secure begins to now crumble beneath them and shake and violently and earthquakes and volcanoes and explosions? I mean, it's going to be a terrifying time as you look at it. And then in verse 15, it says, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, but everyone, including the rich, there's not going to be any. Their money's not going to save them. Every slave, every free man hid among the caves and the rocks and mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rock, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of what? The wrath of the... I want everybody to say it because I want you to feel it and own it. The wrath of the... You see, so many of us, were struggling with this picture of our loving Jesus, and he is. Our sweet, our kind our long-suffering, our Savior, the one who died for us. That's our picture, and Jesus is everything, and it still will be to you. But he is going to come to a place where the wrath is going to be unfolded upon sin, not upon innocence, not upon little kids and innocent people, but upon the ones who hold on to sin. And he's going to give them chance to even repent. He always will. But his day is coming, and it says the day of their wrath, the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? 
the world trembles. The second phase of the sixth seal is 144 evangelists are sealed. In Revelation 7, 1, it says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or any tree. I saw another angel coming from the east having the seal of the living God. And the seal, this is a word that implies like it's a unique device, like a ring, like a king's ring, you know, when he sealed his orders uh, and put it in wax. Everybody knew that's the king's seal. Or you had a special seal that you can put in wax. This is a unique seal that God has. And he's going to call out in a loud voice to the four angels who have been given power now to harm the land and the sea. Now the supernatural is starting to move from the natural to the supernatural. And he says, do not harm the land or the seas until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of what? Israel. And then from each unique tribe, there's 12,000. Now, some scholars have tried to say, well, Israel's out of the picture, so that really is symbolic of believers. And I just don't see it that way. I believe when God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. How many of y'all do that? He made a promise to Israel, and that no matter how much they rejected him, they're his people. He's got a special plan for them. He's going to have a special uh, anointing on their life. And he knows who they are, even if they don't know who they are and whether they're descendants of which tribe. And, you, you, you know, you can get all caught up in that. How many of y'all know God knows every hair on every head? He knows who came through the descendancy of every tribe. And that, I believe they're going to be spread out all over the world. They're going to be in every language, every tribe, every tongue. And all of a sudden they're going, boom, <laughs> wow, Jesus is Lord. And I'm Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I, I don't know how all it's going to work. It's going to be fun to watch, won't it? Because we'll be in heaven. But that's going to happen. And they're going to start preaching the word of God. And, and I really believe millions and millions of Gentiles and Jewish people are going to be saved under this, but God's going to supernaturally protect them, and we'll see that later on. As, in fact, next week we'll see it when I come, or when I come back. The third phase of the sixth seal, the tribulation martyrs are like, who are these people, and where did they come from? Because some people say, well, those are people who were killed all through time and you know died for their faith. No, they, these are unique. He said, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, just like when they did when Jesus came into Jerusalem, remember on his day, conquering. And they cried in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom, thanks and honor and power and strength to be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders asked, Well, who are these in white robes? Who are they and where did they come from? And I answered, Sir, you already know. So this is John talking. Sir, you already know. And he said, yeah, of course I did. That's just a question that I wanted to ask. He says, these are they who have come out of the what? Great tribulation. This is the period, the seven-year period that we're talking about. First is kind of like calm to some degree. Could be wars and, and all kinds of stuff, but it's going to crank up. So it's not going to be perfect, but then in the middle, it's going to really break loose and billions, billions of people are going to be killed and billions, I believe, are going to be saved. Remember, it's following the 144,000 evangelists that are proclaiming Jesus is Lord. So they're now going to be all over the world and people are going to get saved all over the world, but they're going to have to die because of their faith. And that's really the sad thing. But he's going to promise them that they'll never thirst again, and he'll wipe every tear from their eye. So Jesus is taking even these people who have rejected him all their lives. Now when they come to him, he's still going to take them in in his loving arms. He's the loving God. Amen. The seventh seal is a golden censer. And I really believe it's some type of fire. I don't know what it, it exactly looks like. No one does. That comes from heaven. 
And uh, I see it as that way because the censer is smoking, so it has a little bit of fire in it with incense, which is our prayers, but then it says he fills it with fire. And so let's see what happens. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, this alone, you could spend hours just meditating on. What in the world happened? Because remember last week I showed you how in heaven, it's like praise and glory and shouting and loud singing and carrying on to beat the band. Y'all remember that? We had fun. They're having fun. And then all of a sudden, this seal is broken. I think it's almost like when somebody says something other that's real shocking in a room of people, you know, and they all go, <sighs> you know, like that. You know, I think that's what's going to happen there. It's going to be like, oh, like this is God. Something, it's just going to be like silence. And, and if it just said there was silence, but what God put for a half an hour. Can you imagine some people being quiet for 30 minutes? Don't look at them. 30 minutes, not a word. Silence. Your little kid, I mean, some kid, I was on a plane the other day, and that little kid, I don't think, didn't talk, stop talking the whole time. Parents, teach your children there's quiet times, amen? Be like Jesus. There's going to be silence. The seventh seal, silence. Verse 2. And then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God and the angel's hands. So there's something burning in this censer. But then God shifts and says, Then the angel took this censer and filled it with fire from the altar, and he hurled it to the earth. There came peals of thunders, rumblings, flashes of lightnings, and earthquakes. And then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them, which is where we get next time. Seven trumpets, more uh, devastation. There's fire. and What could that be? Maybe that's nuclear missile warheads coming down. I don't, I, I think it's probably more supernatural at this point. Something that looks like maybe fireworks going off in the sky. But it says, you know, even everything's trembling and there's peals of thunder and earthquakes. There's natural stuff going on. This is like, uh, you thought that was bad? One fourth of the world dying? Guess what? It's just now beginning. And we see that Jesus, you know, you might think, well, this is too far-fetched. This is out. No, this is exactly what Jesus himself taught. And that's what I want you to understand. This is Jesus. And we see this in Matthew 24, verse 3. That whole passage of Matthew, read it, because he's talking about the end of times and the signs. And he says, when will this happen? Because he was telling them, hey, some bad stuff is going to come down. I want you to be prepared. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That's how clear it was to them. They knew there were two parts. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Jesus was really clear here. You know that wild and crazy thing that Daniel saw and wrote about 500 years before I came? It's all true. It's all real. He validated everything in there. And exactly, and I, if you want to go back and uh, if you, didn't, you weren't here, I did a series on the end of the last days. And I go with infinite detail how everything that Daniel said on the exact day happened exactly like he said. And he said that there, he says, verse 21, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. So some people might think, well, it's going to be bad. It'll be like World War II or it'll be like COVID or something. No, no, no. Jesus even said, you've never seen anything like this. This is going to be so beyond it's unequaled. Even the flood of Noah, it's, it's beyond the, everything else. And then he says, and I, I caught this for the first time this week. And he says, and never to be equal again 
Even in this wrath being poured out, Jesus is showing his great mercy. You remember when he, the flood came and everyone was destroyed, but the ones who took safety in the God's protection, the ark? And he knew, because they had never seen rain. It says, mist just came from the ground. They'd never seen rain. They never knew that. Can you imagine mankind hearing from Noah for generations? Every time it rained after that, maybe God's going to destroy the earth again. Oh, and they walk around in fear. And God made them a promise there. He says, I destroyed the earth except for Noah and his family that took safety in the ark, which is now our Jesus. And I make a promise to you, I'll never destroy it with the flood. And he put a rainbow in the sky. When you see that, just remember. And now God is even saying, you know, this is going to be bad, but I'm going to restore everything. I'm going to make everything, and there will be peace that will last for eternity because I'm a great God. And then he says in verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, this is Jesus speaking in Matthew, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days were shortened. For those that are Israel and now believers, and those who are believers who now he sees as grafted in, he's saying, I, I just will cut it short because if not, every one of them would have died. But that's the promise. That's what Jesus said. And now all of a sudden he's given us the details in the book of Revelation. And so my application to you is, are you happy you're not going to be there? Can you say amen? And are you ready? Do you know that you're ready? And you do that by putting your faith in Christ. It's not a formula. It's not how much you go to church or read your Bible. It's truly faith in Christ and what he's doing. It's not going to be your works. It's not going to be your deeds. You'll have works. You'll have deeds. You'll give. You'll serve. But it's that faith in Jesus. And that's what he wants you to have. Whether you're here, you're at Middletown, you're watching online, put your faith in Jesus. Confess him as Lord. Believe it in your heart and be saved so that you don't have to go through this and be with him in heaven. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the warning. And Lord, help us get over our shyness or whatever. Help us in a loving gracious way be able to share with people get right with God this is true this is real it's going to happen and then Lord help us prepare and be ready for whatever comes down we're in your hands and we give ourselves to you Jesus and we pray this in Jesus name amen amen come on let's give God praise for the word amen you know what? I, I love you so much. I'm going to miss you for two weeks, but we got something great for you. Uh, so be praying for us. I'm excited. I can't hardly wait to see our family. They're excited for you. They're praying for you. You pray for them. Pray for us. And uh, we're changing out the order. We had the announcements in the middle. So we're through. Amen. And everybody can say hallelujah. Go with God. He goes with you. God bless you.